pleasure of being here, and um, and I really couldn't uh, couldn't resist uh, um, coming out here when I when I saw the uh, uh, the subject uh, you, you you want to focus on. Uh, it's um, it's been five years that I uh, I'm in in charge in Brussels of uh, environment policy, and five years ago when I came in, um, environment policy in to to eighty percent roughly would have been climate, energy and climate issues. It was uh, 2009, it was leading up to uh, the Copenhagen uh, uh, climate uh, conference. Everyone had understood that uh, there is some problem in the way in which we produce and consume on this planet uh, with regard to energy use and the effect of energy use on uh, the world's climate. Since then, uh, we, have been, we have been trying to broaden uh, this, uh, this issue uh, and we have come up uh, uh, with, a, with a wider assessment of um, how soon to be 9 billion people uh, will be able to live on this planet uh, enjoying a standard of living that we enjoy here in Europe. Um, if, you, if you think about this, if you start looking at what we need for uh, the way in which we live today, uh, and these 9 billion people who are expected to be around in 2050, so it's not uh, in, in a couple of hundred years, but it's uh, uh, in, in a very short foreseeable uh, future, um, we have come to understand that we probably need natural resources uh, uh, that we would only find on two and a half times planet Earth. Um, and obviously, uh, despite technological advances, cloning a planet is unlikely to happen uh, within, within that foreseeable uh, time frame. So we need to... We need to rethink. We need to become resource efficient uh, as societies. Uh, the key pressure for this reality is coming from the developing part of this world because that's where all uh, the expected uh, demographic growth is taking place. Uh, Europe, the United States, Japan have barely grown over the last decades, all the growth to the 7 billion people that we are now, starting when I was born at a rough 3 billion people on this planet, uh, has already taken place in uh, the developing part. Uh, and uh, the, the expected growth to 9 billion is taking place there also. So we will have over-exponential demand for uh, consumption because these people, on average, don't uh, don't benefit of, uh, uh, of the standard of living, of consumerism uh, in the way in which we see it uh, uh, in Europe. And I'm applying European levels. I'm not even trying to, uh, to think of US levels. Uh, then we need, to, we need to clone the blue planet uh, a couple of times more, I'm afraid. So the real issue that we have uh, in today's uh, uh, economic reality is how do we make sure that we use the resources of this planet uh, in a way to allow 9 billion people to, uh, to have a decent life? That's, that's the question that uh, over the last four years we have tried to address. And um, my department has, has just made uh, uh, a a proposal, a text, uh, drying out um, what we want to focus on in the next uh, five, six years, and it's called living well within the limits of this planet. And that really sums, sums up uh, uh, how we look at the nexus issues. We, we have started being specialists, specialists for food, or specialists for climate questions, on energy issues, on water issues, on chemicals, uh, on, on air quality. And we have tried 
to define, to define policy uh, replies, answers, that would focus just on this one narrow aspect. And we're beginning to see that by doing this, we take very often the wrong turns. Uh, one example uh, that uh, people are beginning to talk about, this year is the year of, of air quality in Europe. Um, and Europe has, on air quality, a significantly different problem uh, from other developed parts of this world, notably the United States. Why? Because we have focused, due to climate change and energy use, a lot on taking uh, private transportation with diesel engines. Diesel engines were said to be less uh, energy consuming. You get more mileage out of uh, uh, a liter of diesel with diesel engines than you got out of, uh, out of petrol. Uh, and it's also said that it would be therefore less uh, CO2 emitting and you were doing something good for climate. The problem with these diesel engines is that they uh, leave through their exhaust fine particles in the air uh, that uh, uh, have damning consequences on human health. Uh, the air quality or the lack thereof in Europe is today the, the biggest killer uh, that we have, uh, bigger than car accidents or bigger than uh, 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 other diseases. So we have produced by shifting a fleet of cars away from petrol to diesel because we wanted to be doing good for climate, we have created in our cities uh, a problem uh, with the air quality that we now have to address. And addressing it now means that we have to take another U-turn, introduce additional forms of controlling. Had we thought through uh, the nexus issue uh, before just going for something that would be energy saving, uh, we would have made smarter policy. In the introduction, I heard that uh, uh, water, energy, uh, it's quite clear that the two are, are, really, are, are linked. If we want to have water, we need energy, and water can be used to produce energy. The, the, the relationship between the two is, is, is very, very direct, and food is very directly related to it also. But my key message on, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the Nexus story is uh, it's great that here you're talking about not just energy, but that you've added food and, uh, and water. It would be even better if we looked at all of the different uh, uh, environmental challenges and impacts, if we took uh, uh, biodiversity and ecosystems uh, uh, and our effect on those into account, uh, if we therefore made clear that we have a better understanding of what uh, chemical substances we use in our production processes, because unfortunately those substances we find back through wastewater in our surface waters, um, that uh, we, we see these substances possibly in, in the air uh, as uh, uh, additional pollutants. Uh, and that it is also very clear that where we have water uh, and air quality problems, we're immediately having soil problems also. And soils is what we need, uh, fertile soils is what we need to produce food. Uh, the, the way in which we consume, the way in which we produce is really circular and what we put out there into an environment, eventually through food chain or through what we drink, what we, uh, uh, what we uh, breathe, the air that we breathe, comes back uh, to affect uh, our, our own health as humans. 
and I think it's very important that we begin to be a lot more focused and aware of those, of those issues. Last but not least, uh, uh, in, uh, to, to describe uh, a little bit uh, the, the, the overall nexus uh, picture, we need to, uh, we need to take uh, a lot more attention to waste. The way we produce and consume so far is extremely wasteful. We have learned, we have developed over the last century to dig up the ground, to take out the, uh, the raw materials that we needed, to produce goods, and when we didn't like them any longer, to put them back into the ground, into landfills. Uh, that was the kind of uh, life of, uh, of, of our products. We're producing incredible amounts of, uh, of waste, and this waste very often uh, is rather toxic and dangerous. It's not only the very direct toxic uh, forms that we have to worry about. Um, we see today in our oceans, uh, uh, we call it plastic soup, uh, fine particles of, uh, of all kinds of plastics uh, uh, that are prevalent in, in all our, our oceans and that through the oceans, again, through food chain, are beginning to come back uh, into our direct lives. We can no longer afford, particularly in going forward to 9 billion people that want to consume, we can no longer handle waste <coughs> as waste. We have to begin to use waste as a secondary uh, raw material and to bring it back into a circle economy. Um, we are beginning uh, to do this uh, and I think uh, in, in Europe we're rather more advanced in, in moving in this direction than in many other parts of the world and perhaps this has to do with the fact that we are not that well endowed with primary resources. So trying to use secondary resources uh, is, is something that uh, economically is, is more easily understood. But uh, we still have, among the 28 European member states, uh, member states where 95% of, uh, of household wave, waste, of municipal waste, goes into landfills. We have member states uh, where that percentage is uh, uh, at or below 1%. So we have a huge uh, uh, difference in, in understanding and in, in moving forward into a resource-efficient circular economy that takes account of uh, the interrelations uh, between availability of natural <coughs> resources, of raw materials, and the way we treat them. But that is going to be the, uh, the, the real big challenge for, for the future. Now let me say a few words on the more narrow uh, nexus uh, uh, also that, uh, that you have put up here. We know that uh, uh, today we have uh, um, already uh, a, a rough billion people uh, who have uh, uh, no regular access to drinking water. One billion now. We're adding two billion in the developing countries uh, to uh, our population. So you can imagine what challenge uh, uh, we have. Uh, we have some uh, um, uh, 2.5, 2.6 billion people uh, who have no adequate nutrition today as we speak. Uh, we have uh, uh, another uh, 2.6, 2.7 billion people who have no adequate uh, uh, cooking uh, uh, and, uh, and heating uh, facilities. Uh, we have uh, uh, over a billion people who have uh, no access to electricity. We have uh, um, two and a half uh, billion people who have no access to decent sanitation. All of those numbers are very directly related to the three elements of the nexus that we're talking about here. And that situation is very rapidly degradating. 
it's getting worse, it's not getting better. Uh, so we, we need to focus on these, uh, on these issues. Um, and, and I think the, the ways in which we are trying in Europe uh, to define these policies is uh, uh, to, to basically create an awareness of the availability of these resources. Uh, when, I, when I give a presentation, normally uh, people are very surprised when I say that uh, we are moving into a water scares uh, uh, period. Um, I had to give speeches in Brussels about water scarcity and everyone was telling me you must be not quite right, uh, look outside, it's raining again. As always, uh, you can't try to pretend that we have water scarcity in Belgium. The groundwater levels in Belgium are coming down. We are abstracting, even in rainy Belgium, we're abstracting more water than Mother Nature is regenerating as we speak. Uh, and that is as problematic as if you were spending more from your bank account than you're putting into it. <laughs> At some point in time, you're going to be without uh, uh, the, uh, the, the resource. So we need, we need to create this awareness. And awareness in the systems in which we work very often comes with price. If, uh, if something has no price or a low price, then people feel that, well, there is no problem in using it or even abusing uh, uh, that, uh, that resource. I learned that lesson when I, when I, first, uh, when I first started to talk uh, to, uh, to, to European beer producers about their use of, uh, of, of water. I thought it might be a story that is of interest in Ireland also. Um, but uh, I, I was talking to Belgian breweries uh, about uh, the, uh, the water they, they use in producing a litre of beer. And um, when, I, when I raised this question three years ago with them, they were saying that uh, they uh, use roughly uh, seven litres of, of water for one litre of beer. But um, having, having had a discussion between us, they said we, can, we, we actually think we can do better and we are going to commit uh, to reducing the water use by 50%. Uh, and over the last three years they have made uh, really substantive progress uh, uh, in, in that direction, which shows that it was not all that difficult. It just needed awareness. It just needed started to think about the fact that uh, uh, you can reuse uh, water. You can't. You, you you don't just think that water is going to be plenty, and uh, and you just take it out, and uh, the, uh, the the used water is uh, is sort of uh, dismissed back into uh, in, into nature. So this awareness raising is is what uh, European policy is very largely about. But I told you in the beginning that the uh, uh, the issue that we're talking about is an issue, is a global issue. If it was only for Europe, with no demographic growth, uh, the, the challenges would be very different. But we are part of a planet, so we need to find these global solutions. And we were last year in, uh, in, in Rio, 20 years after uh, Rio 92, the first sort of sustainability uh, world summit, to try to see um, how we can collectively uh, address this channel, this challenge of 9 billion people on this planet. And there I think we still have a lot of work to, uh, to do. For the moment it is very largely Europeans who argue for resource efficient, efficiency and for a better, um, more sustainable growth path. Developing countries are very largely still copying the way in which they think, probably they are largely right, Europe and the United States have industrialized and have developed 
the level of wealth that we're enjoying for the moment. And they're just basically saying, you did it that way, now it's our turn, we want to do it in exactly the same way. And when we come and say, hey, we have to collectively be aware that there's only so much, uh, a limited amount of, of natural resources on this planet, uh, then they basically think that we're trying to slow down their growth. So what we need to do is we need to come up with, uh, with development models, with economic development models that show that resource efficiency works and that a circular economy, not putting um, waste into landfills, but using waste, bringing waste, keeping waste within uh, the circular economy for, for next generation of, uh, of, of products, that this is at least as competitive and at least as uh, good in creating jobs and creating wealth for people who are desperately looking for being lifted out of, uh, out of poverty. That debate uh, is, is taking place uh, for the moment and we need to really move this debate forward. Um, it is relevant when we look at, uh, uh, at, the, at the food issue. One of the, one of the issues that uh, in, in Brussels um, we, are, we are still striving with in terms of understanding the nexus uh, is what happens if in Europe uh, we produce uh, less food, we shift to producing uh, biofuels, um, how does that affect the, the, the global uh, availability of, uh, of food? How does it affect availability of soils? And what does it do uh, to climate change? We know that breaking up uh, uh, grassland, grace, breaking up, uh, uh, cutting down forest, uh, uh, breaking up uh, forest land to produce food will set enormous amounts of CO2 free uh, that will uh, very directly and very seriously uh, add to our climate change problems. Uh, on the other hand, from a development point of view, for the last 30 years, we have been pushed to produce less food in Europe and to have food produced in developing countries for their own needs development of developing countries very often will have to start with agriculture. It's one of the things that everyone uh, relatively quickly can, can pick up and some uh, uh, start-up industrial sectors, but agriculture always is, uh, uh, is a key sector there. The, the point I want to, I want to, to come to is, is called ILEC. Uh, indirect land use change. Basically the reasoning is that uh, we say that land use change can be problematic uh, for biodiversity on this planet. We cut down forests, we dramatically reduce biodiversity, we weaken ecosystems and this will have uh, uh, very uh, significant negative effects on <coughs> the capacity of humans to exist on this planet. Um, we, we therefore should be careful about uh, uh, how we do this, but if we want to increase agricultural production in uh, uh, developing countries, then somehow more soil, more territory will have to be, have to be used to produce this food in, uh, in, in these countries. If as a consequence of, of that, in Europe, we produce less food, should we, should we leave uh, our soils unused, or can those soils be used uh, to producing uh, renewable energy, which is something that we all collectively need. We need to move away from fossil uh, energies to renewable energies, and biomass uh, can be one of those uh, renewable uh, energies that we're looking forward to. We're here in a, in a way trying to deal with a, with a chicken and, uh, and, and egg situation. What is, what is there first? What is triggering the land use change? 
Is it the demand in Europe, possibly in the United States, uh, for biofuels, for renewable forms of fuel? Or is it the fact that we are shifting food production anyway to those parts of the world where demographic growth is taking place? Are we moving food production into developing countries to face their growing numbers? And is that the starting point? Or where do we, where do we start? Looking into this has, has very concrete uh, uh, outcomes because if it is taking place anyway, if food production is supposed to move into developing countries to move towards uh, the, uh, uh, the demographic growth areas, uh, then there is choice uh, in the other parts about the use of, uh, uh, of, of land, of soil in their territories. If, however, um, we are the beginning, we're the starting point, we're shifting out of food production into biofuel production, then we are creating shortage globally for food and therefore we would be held responsible. So this chicken and egg question is, is, is not just a, uh, a theoretical question, but it is one that has very direct uh, consequences on, on how policy can be, can be defined, can be, uh, uh, can be formulated. Uh, if, you take, uh, if you take a moment, uh, you will see that uh, in this uh, uh, communication, living well within the limits of our planet, we have tried to, to address all those different linkages in making it clear that um, Europe is linked in to a global environment, but also that all the sectoral aspects are very directly linked with each other and that um, we cannot uh, as policy makers just say that my driving uh, motivation is to have clean water, clean surface water all over Europe, full stop, and I don't look at other issues. If I don't look at other issues, A, I will miss uh, my, my clean water target because if I forget that uh, water, surface water, is in direct contact with soil and with air, and if those two other resources are polluted, then my water will be polluted, uh, I'm missing that. But I'm missing also the fact that without, uh, or only with clean water, uh, we won't be able to, uh, uh, to have a livable life uh, in, uh, in our respective uh, uh, areas. So we need this global understanding we need to take uh, uh, holistic approaches. We need to define policies that, uh, uh, that become more scarce aware. Scarcity, the limits of this planet. Uh, this planet cannot be expanded. Um, therefore, the answer, since we have uh, demographic growth, and that to me is the starting challenge, if we could, if we had a way of making sure that we're not becoming more and more and more on this planet, things would look differently. But we are going to become more. Uh, every projection that, uh, that comes up is talking about the 9 billion number. What happens after that is less clear, but we're quite certainly going to, uh, to be 9 billion. That is true. Then we have to be more resource efficient, and resource efficient means circular economy. We have to make sure that we have water balances where we understand that we're not abstracting more water than, we, than the world, than the region where we're living can regenerate. We have to make sure that our air is of a quality that is worth, uh, um, that, that, is, that takes into account health needs. Our Chinese friends are, are just beginning to realize that uh, uh, air really is uh, something of, of very, very high value, and that you have forgotten about air quality, then uh, uh, the environment is going to make you pay very, very dearly for it. Um, we need to look about uh, um, balance on soil. Soils are very much 
abused also. In Europe, we, uh, we completely seal off every year um, a surface equivalent to the size of Berlin. I'm using Berlin not only because I'm German, but because in Europe it is the biggest uh, city in uh, territorial uh, uh, size. <coughs> Every 10 years we take out one complete member state of the European Union. Every 10 years we seal off soil equivalent to the surface of Cyprus. Uh, when you think about it, I think very quickly you can understand that this is not a sustainable way uh, to, uh, uh, to move forward. How are we taking it away? We're taking it away because uh, our cities are growing. There's growing urbanization. There's growing use of infrastructure. And all of these need to sealing off soil. When it's sealed off, off there is no more biodiversity. There's no more alternative use for all this. So we need to think uh, in, in, in all the key natural resources of this planet of how our policy can be made sustainable. And sustainability, true for financial sustainability also, is that uh, you cannot, over an extended period of time, take more out of your bank account than you put back into it. It's the old story. Uh, it should be so easy, but so many of us have got it wrong, both in the financial area, unfortunately also in the environmental area. And I hope that uh, uh, the kind of talk that we're having here today will create a better awareness for the needs to plan policy, to plan policy in a sustainable manner. Uh, and that goes through respecting the limits of the planet and moving into a circular economy. Thank you very much. Thank you.